I'll give the call to the Honourable Elise Irwin and um, ask members to convey the usual courtesies because it's an inaugural speech. The Honourable Elise Irwin. Mr President, thank you for this opportunity to address the members of this place. It gives me great pleasure to speak with you all tonight. I'd like to congratulate the members opposite on their success in the recent state election. I'm sure they are looking forward to welcoming their colleagues on May 22, which is also the date that my short tenure here will end. I'm very fortunate to be here, filling the casual vacancy created in the North Metropolitan Region when my Liberal colleague, the Honourable Peter Katzenbarnas, resigned and subsequently won the seat of Hillary's to continue representing the people of WA in the other place. It is a vagary of our political system that affords me this short but very sweet opportunity. I wish the Honourable Peter Katzenbarnas all the best and am sure he will continue to represent the people of Hillary's in the same manner he has represented the whole of the North Metropolitan Region alongside the Honourable Peter Collier, the Honourable Michael Mission thank you, and the Honourable Liz Baget. Of course, I won't be the only one leaving this place on May 21. I recognise you all for the contributions you have made during your service to our great state and I wish all members leaving the very best in the next chapters, including yourself, Mr President. Some of you may know me as a policy advisor for the previous government, a small business owner, a surf lifesaver, a community volunteer, a Liberal Party member or as a friend, wife and mother. As a child, I grew up in a close-knit working class family. I, like others here, am a fifth generation Australian. My forebears on both sides immigrated to South Australia from the UK as free settlers with the First Fleets. My parents' background was farming in the mid-north of South Australia before migrating themselves to WA in 1956 and farming around the southwest. I say migrating because my older sister, who was about eight at the time, thought that Western Australians must have spoken another language. It seemed so far from where she had spent her early years in the Clare Valley. And that's how people in the East think of the West Australians as well, over there in the West. Dad had returned from World War II, where he served in Borneo and New Guinea, to his parents' property at Farrell's Flat with his two brothers. After having two sons of his own, he and Mum were looking for a new start and had heard of land on offer for returned servicemen in WA. So Mum and Dad boarded the train in Port Pirie and started their trek to WA with their three young children and all their belongings strapped onto a 1952 Holden FX Coupe Ute. They disembarked in Kalgoorlie two days later, just on sunset. My mother's very proper South Australian Methodist upbringing hadn't prepared her for Kalgoorlie at night in the 1950s and needless to say, their stay there didn't last too long. Dad's experiences serving in the army served him well in this new frontier. He had purchased acreage at Hillman near Darkin. He and mum and my brothers and sister had the back-breaking job of clearing the farm completely of bush by hand before they could start the real job of farming. My story starts about 10 years after all that. I was born in Subiaco after mum and dad decided to leave the farm and come to Perth in 1966. My three siblings were all in high school or working by that stage and I think it was a bit of a shock to have a baby around the house again. But my memories of my childhood are full of Dad working in his shed and turning our entire backyard into a veggie patch, Mum bottling and preserving madly to keep up with produce that just kept coming. You can take the farmer off the land but never the will to keep producing. My parents grew up in the Depression era and were ever mindful of wastage, not running up a debt and, heaven forbid, buying anything on credit. But Dad also brought home some demons from the war. He never spoke of his experiences to our mother or us kids, but he would uh, never commemorate Anzac Day by going to the march. That was a day he would go to the pub and not come home until we were all in bed. Mum knew better than us what Dad was going through, and it was a frustration of their marriage that he wouldn't talk about what he had seen or done during that terrible time. I speak of this now because it's topical. We hear more in the media about what our veterans suffer and the suicide rates are truly shocking. I acknowledge my very dear friend, Dr Lisa Wood, who's here tonight, uh, with her husband and our friend Rod, and her recent work with the federal government on researching the effects of depression on our Defence Force personnel. I hope that the recent funding announcements will go some way to assigning them, assisting them through their dark days. 
On this note, I also acknowledge my good friend Wendy Kehoe, who is also here tonight, and her willingness to talk of her own and her colleagues' experiences in our modern day army. I remember it used to cost Mum $2 to fill up the EH Holden she drove, and Dad sitting out on the veranda in the summer with Johnny Cash playing on the record player. I remember as a child growing up with a freedom I think some of our children lack. We rode our bikes to school or walked. We all wore school uniform, and if you were naughty, you were dealt with quickly, no questions asked. Our parents always backed up the teacher. We respected our teachers and loved our parents. Summer holidays were spent with friends in the street under the lawn sprinklers and riding bikes. Dinner was eaten at the dining room table with the family. The TV was turned off. We sat together and talked about our day. Invariably, Mum would turn the conversation to current affairs. She loved nothing better than a good debate on what was going on in the world. Mum and Dad were staunch, dyed-in-the-wool liberals, but one of my brothers was leaning a little to the left, so some pretty lively discussions would erupt on occasion. Both my parents worked full-time. I was expected to be resilient, resourceful and independent. I was the original latchkey kid, but of course they hadn't come up with that label in those days. Parents just did what they had to do and we all helped where we could. Growing up in a family where hard work and a can-do attitude was expected and celebrated has had a great influence on how I've conducted my life and how I've raised my children. When I met my husband Mark, he introduced me to Surf Lifesaving. His passion was and still is Scarborough Surf Lifesaving Club. I learnt fairly quickly, quickly there was no way to beat it, so I would have to join too. Little did I know then what a great part the club would play in my life and the life of our family. I have some club members here tonight supporting me and I thank them for their friendship over many years, especially Nick and Cathy Stewart, who have been with us through the good and the more challenging times. I can't imagine what not being part of this great organisation would be like. It has taught us all the value of community service. What we have put in has been repaid tenfold in the skills we have learnt, the friendships created and the sense of belonging we all hold dear. It has given our family a core sense of purpose within our community. I was honoured to be president of Surf Scarborough Surf Club for four years after holding various committee positions for the previous ten. Amongst those positions, I am most proud that I coached junior lifesavers in their required qualifications for nine years. I was also on the Australian Surf Lifesaving Championships Committee for four years. I liaised with national, state and local bodies and corporations in negotiating the successful staging of the Australian Championships at Scarborough in 2007, 08 and 09 and again in 2014. This event has more competitors than the Commonwealth Games and is held annually. The Championships return to Scarborough again in 2018 and we are looking forward to showing off a revitalised Scarborough to the rest of Australia. The development of the Scarborough Revitalisation Project, initiated by the former Liberal Government in association with the City of Stirling, is a massive achievement for both the electorate of Scarborough and the State of Western Australia. I was pleased to play a small part in that and to have been able to represent our club in the negotiations and early planning stages. Scarborough was languishing as a tired and decrepit beachfront precinct. The MRA has created a vision for Scarborough that will see the area flourish and become a place of pride for all Western Australians. I will put on record here tonight that I am concerned about one aspect of the project which has since been scrapped by a new Transport Minister, and that is the extension of the egress points for the area. It is imperative that these road connections be implemented or an alternative be created for visitors and residents to be able to safely leave the area. Presently, and for some time, the congestion of egress from the Scarborough foreshore area has been such that it can take over 45 minutes from exiting a car bay to reaching West Coast Highway, either at Scarborough Beach Road or Brighton Road, a distance of approximately 200 to 500 metres. This is absurd for the general user and dangerous for emergency vehicles. A small but vocal group opposed to the road extensions are claiming a victory of sorts at the Minister's decision. Let's hope this doesn't result in an unwarranted fatality due to an ambulance not being able to leave the area with a priority one patient that our surf lifesaving volunteers have managed to rescue from a drowning. I take this opportunity to acknowledge Tanya Chanel, Rob Mason, Tanil and Glenn Ross, Dave Thompson, Bob Welsh, Rod Dalziel, Tim Shifley and David Irwin 
all club members I relied on for advice and guidance during my term as president of Scarborough Surf Club. Our children, Jack, Kate and Henry, all participate in surf sports and patrols. They assist with community events in water safety and take on leadership roles within the club and their respective schools. They are confident and hard-working peer group leaders. All three of our children have been involved in actively saving lives on our beach and we are so happy to have given them that opportunity. Our eldest son, Jack, has been recognised at state level for his contribution to youth development, of which we are very proud. The value of surf lifesaving in Western Australia as a community organisation cannot be overplayed. This last summer, 66 lives were saved by volunteer patrolling lifesavers on Scarborough Beach alone, and almost 1,000 lives were saved statewide. Imagine, if you will, that we were talking about 1,000 people drowning at our beaches last summer. Imagine the heartache and loss that would mean, not to mention the economic consequences for those families affected. Volunteers undertake to keep our beaches safe so that we can all enjoy our beautiful Western Australian summers. Surf Lifesaving is an amazing organisation and one that I am proud to be associated with. In 2010, an opportunity arose for me to work in a parliamentarian's office. I've worked for the Honourable Lisa Harvey MLA for seven years, firstly in her electorate office and then in her ministerial office as a policy advisor. I sincerely thank her for the opportunity and support she has given me. I truly believe that if you want to make a worthwhile contributing difference or be a part of shaping society for future generations, then you simply must become involved. I've enjoyed my time in Lisa's offices immensely and wow, what a learning curve. I've had exposure to grassroots, local, state and federal issues. Most importantly has been the exposure to a side of life I've never thankfully personally experienced. Like most electorate officers, one of our biggest issues is state housing. This can be both extremely frustrating and wonderfully rewarding. We really get criticism from both sides. Homeowners not happy that their taxes are paying welfare and tenants feeling they have no avenues for escaping the welfare cycle. I saw generational reliance on welfare that was devastating. These issues need long-term strategies and analysis with a view to reducing the welfare burden on taxpayers while looking after our legitimately disadvantaged and disenfranchised. I also worked in the portfolio areas of small business, tourism, women's interests and training and workforce development in the Ministerial Office. I'd like to acknowledge the wonderful and innovative work done by those departments I had the pleasure of working with during the time we worked in those portfolios. In particular, the De Directors General and CEOs, David Eaton, Stephanie Buckland, Jennifer Matthews and Ruth Shane. Being involved in the development of policy across these sectors was so personally fulfilling and worthwhile. Researching and implementing decisive change and influencing the way Western Australians conduct their daily lives was truly enriching and I feel very privileged to have been given that opportunity. Currently, we are seeing a downturn in the economy of Western Australia. This is a blow to our small business owners in particular. As a small business owner, you are expected to be an expert on all levels of your business – accounting, economics, law and industrial relations. This often creates unforeseen costs and stress when they become entangled in the red tape that is associated with statutory bodies, local regulations and tenancy agreements. A small business operator may be forced to seek expensive specialist advice. It takes hard work, persistence, resilience, independence, resourcefulness and courage to stick with it. A small business owner is also at the mercy of outside forces. A government not aligned to small business will be disastrous. Over-regulatory government policy will spill the end for many small business owners. Payroll tax is a burden which prevents growth of business and promotes disincentive for employment. We hear every day how small business operators are struggling with these issues. It may be with the ATO, creditors or landlords. With the introduction by the previous Liberal Government of the Small Business Commissioner, small business has a voice and a real avenue to seek help with legal issues. Small business does have a mechanism to effectively seek low-cost mediation through the Small Business Development Corporation, and I congratulate our former State Liberal Government for assessing and meeting this need. However, 
This agency needs greater funding and acknowledgement of the important part it plays in this vital sector of our economy. Tourism continues to be a vibrant component to the economy of Western Australia. It will continue to provide employment for our job seekers and enriching experiences for our visitors. It is a large and encompassing sector with new and innovative businesses consistently coming online. It's an exciting area to be a part of. As the construction phase of the mining sector is wound down, tourism and other areas of our economy, such as agriculture, will have an opportunity for growth. With guidance and support, I believe these sectors will shine and offer our economy resilience into the future. Alongside these opportunities for sectors, we must also consider how some of our more marginalised participants will be able to take advantage of opportunities going forward. Research demonstrates that better business and community service outcomes can be achieved with a diverse workforce and a diverse leadership group. Unconscious bias has a devastating effect on career opportunities for women, people over 55, people with disability and job seekers with English as a second language. An area that I've worked in over the last four years has been women's interests and undoubtedly supporting women's economic independence will not only improve choices for women but also contributes to their financial security in later life. The gender pay gap in Western Australia is around 25 per cent. The World Economic Forum predicts it will take until 2133 to achieve global gender parity. I'm not sure about my female colleagues, but I'm not prepared to wait that long. And I certainly don't think my daughter Kate should have to wait that long either. Various factors contribute to the gap, including workforce segregation, women taking time out of work to attend to caring responsibilities, higher numbers of men than women in senior positions across almost all occupations, and gender-based discrimination, including unconscious bias in recruitment practices. Females have represented around 60% of Australian university graduates for at least two decades, but only make up about 3% of CEO positions. Leaders across government, academia and industry have identified unconscious bias in recruitment and promotion processes as one of the factors that can affect women's engagement in the workforce. Inclusive organisational policies and practices are needed to facilitate positive changes in attitude and behaviour towards women's return to and retention in the workforce. Superannuation is a key to security in retirement. Recent research shows a woman's average balance of $68,600 is just over 60% of the average balance for men. Lower average salaries, taking time out of work for caring duties or working part-time are some of the contributing factors to women having less super than men. Consider that in the context of a single woman who has not earned enough money over her lifetime to pay off a mortgage but wishes to retire. What will her options be in retirement? Will she need to go on a five-year waiting list with the Department of Housing to be placed in an area not of her choosing? How will she support herself while on that waiting list and where will she live? Economic security is the benchmark to personal security as well as an enabler to improve circumstances. Retirement options improve, healthcare improves, workforce participation choices improve, participation in society improves, as well as an ability to leave a bad relationship or living situation. The former Liberal-led state government sponsored the Filling the Pool research project which championed more women in leadership roles. Working with leading West Australian employers and organisations and renowned academics, the Committee for Perth identified ways to address the gender imbalance at senior levels in West Australian organisations. Lack of childcare options and gender bias were both identified as disablers to women seeking to improve their career options. Access to childcare is fundamental to women's increased workforce participation and attainment of leadership roles. Quality childcare also impacts positively on children's early development. For some parents, childcare located close to work best suits their needs. For other parents, childcare close to home or transport links work best. To better meet these needs, opportunities to locate more childcare centres along our rail and road corridors is imperative. Readily accessible information about childcare locations, availability and quality still remains a challenge for many parents. 
More work will be required to market options to parents and to stay abreast of changing requirements as well as eliminating red tape where possible. Finally, I would like to touch on training and workforce development to simply say that if the vocational education and training area does not continue to develop as it has, then we are doing our community a disservice, especially our school leavers and those that may seek an alternative to university entrance. I know from personal experience with my own children that an academic career does not suit everyone and the op op options a vocational education offers some in our community can instil a passion for learning that no schoolroom ever will. My son Henry is testament to that. The smile on his face when he gets home from work every day is in stark contrast to the moody and tired teenager he was after a school day. In conclusion, Mr President, I thank all the members and parliamentary staff, especially yourself, our whip, Honourable Alyssa Hayden, and the Honourable Liz Bajat. You have all made me feel very welcome for my short but sweet stay here in this place, and I wish you well. I understand the importance of our system of government that has afforded me this privilege, and I hope to continue serving the community of the North Metropolitan Region in some other capacity when my tenure is complete. I thank my parents, Maxine and Don Ianson, who unfortunately are no longer with us, but whom I think of often, as well as my sister Leonie and brothers Chris and Stephen, and all our extended family of in-laws and outlaws. I especially thank my husband Mark and children, Jack, Kate and Henry. Without your support and love, I wouldn't be here today. <laughs>